Hello and welcome back once again to the HR Social Hour Half Hour Podcast. This is episode 71. John and Wendy talk to Ashley Valenzuela Rissian. I'm your host, John. And I'm Wendy. How's it going, John? I'm great. Once again, <laughs> having a bit of a tech, tech night. It happens. That's the beautiful world of podcasting. Yes, for you. it is. Wendy, I had said something briefly on the last episode where I, I think I told everybody that we would make our last announcement for the year now, and so we are. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are headed to North Dakota Sherm. Yes, Grand Forks, North Dakota, heading straight up I-29, getting close to Canada, but it's it, it'll be fun. It's gonna It's a great time of year to go to North Dakota, I'll say that for sure. <laughs> we, we were scheduled to be there September 17th through 19, mm-hmm. and believe it or not, we are not speaking together. Right. Uh, we are going to be expanding on the Wonder Women and diversity mm-hmm. inclusion piece of the conversation. I'm going to be talking social recruiting, marketing, thinking uh, thinking about building audiences. And yeah. I'm excited because I've never seen you present anything other than <laughs> Disrupt, which is not a bad thing, but no. that's not a full bore presentation as such. So I'm very excited to get to see you in action and I get to tweet about it while it's going on too. So I think that'll be fun. I think that'll be fun. It will get to be the most I've ever been tweeted about while speaking. (laughs) You know, it's, it's funny as I was sitting there looking at the kind of looking at the year and it's again, it's just been absolutely amazing what, what we've been able to do, but now we can say the together New York, Vegas, Orlando, and Grand Forks. Yeah. I think, Four great places. We want to thank John Friend and, and the folks at Indy Sherm for the invitation. And again, we're really, really excited to take part. And I get to see the other Dakota now, which yeah. I've not done yet. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm adding I'm adding stars to the map or whatever. I don't know. What do you put on a map to places you've been? I've never been to North to North Little Dakota. Pins. No, I have pins, okay. something. Yeah. yeah, you know, everything's online. I gotta find a <laughs> Map there. Enough, uh, enough. Andy Sherm talk. We'll be doing more as we get closer. I am incredibly excited about tonight's guest, Wendy. I'm going to gush a little bit, if I may. Go ahead. Several months ago, uh, Ashley reached out to me on LinkedIn and introduced herself and said, "I listen to your podcast. I really appreciate what you're all doing. I would love to connect." And we did. And I, I was very flattered. I always appreciate when people still personalize notes, but that somebody had found the show that we don't know that we just had no connection to at all. And then had a chance to actually meet Ashley at HR redefined briefly. I was trying to deal with an issue at work, which we know how that goes when you're at conferences. Anyhow, I got a chance to say hello. And then we heard her speak uh, on a panel. Mm -hmm. This blew me away and we've had a chance to talk since I am so excited to again, have her as part of the conversation here because I really think more people need to know her and what she's doing. Having said that, I'll let you make the introduction and we will get started. So excited to welcome Ashley to the show tonight. It Yes, it was a pleasure to hear her speak at uh, HR Redefined in New York. She is the Director of Human Resources for White Construction Group, located in Castle Rock, Colorado, where she is responsible for leading the organization's employee relations, risk mitigation, talent management, and workforce development strategies. Ashley holds her PHR from the HRCI. She also received a Master's of Arts in Latin American Studies from the University of New Mexico and will graduate this December with her Master's of Science in Organizational Leadership and Strategic Human Resources from Regis University in Denver. As Namely's first HR scholarship recipient, she is also currently pursuing her Strategic Human Resources Certificate from Cornell University. Ashley has expertise in workplace culture, employee engagement, and diversity strategies. Ashley, thank you for taking some time out of all of that education that you're doing, which is fantastic, to join us tonight. And our first question is, what's in your glass? Coffee. Coffee is all <laughs> I'm convinced it's the secret to life. <laughs> well, Ashley, I-, I gushed a bit. I told you I was going to, and... You know, I know what you're up to now. We've talked a little bit uh, in the last many months about kind of what you're up to now. But how exactly did you get your start in human resources? Fun fact, I actually grew up with human resources. My father is currently a vice president of human resources in the meat industry. So growing up, I had the luxury to help with union avoidance training and employee orientations. And I was the actor in the background for a lot of training videos And in addition to that, I was fortunate enough to be able to travel to different Sherm conferences, 
and really meet some fantastic HR professionals who are still part of my life and my network today. Once upon a time, I actually took an aptitude test way back when, when I was in high school, and I recommended that I go into HR. And of course, with my father being in HR, I was like, I'm not going to do that. There's no way. My dad's in HR. And over time, I realized that I had this true passion for HR, and I was pretty good at it. I, I pursued a career. And now my brother, actually, in the last year, I say he converted to the dark side. He used to be an operations manager, and now he's an HR director for a, a, a startup. So we've got three HR professionals in my house, one VP, two directors. So I think Christmas is going to be a lot of fun this year. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be uh, who can tell the best story, right? <laughs> Absolutely. We're, it's going to be the game of, you know, who's calling who's, who's buff because you can always tell who's in HR when they have like the most outrageous stories and you want to say, well, you're in HR. So I want to believe that. But at the same time, that's just so outrageous. I don't know if it's true. <laughs> and we all say, yeah, no, nope, yeah. it's true. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so, Ashley, tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that you faced working in the construction industry as a female and how you've dealt with those issues. I actually see a lot of similarities between human resources and construction. I believe that both are right for some constructive disruption. HR is often perceived as being kind of the chief of fun, we're paper pushers, or we're the no sayers. We also often get labeled with being disconnected from the business. So HR has some rebranding to do, and I believe that HR is uniquely positioned to provide that competitive advantage in what I call Workplace 2.0, and I think it's really where the magic happens. I'm always talking about HR magic, and my employees give me a hard time about that, but I really do think it it takes a special finesse and technique. So in that similar vein, construction is often perceived as being old school, male-dominated, rough. People tend to think that we kind of have this cavalier approach to people. And when you look at the statistics, only 9% of our workforce is female and 0.9% is the average HR presence in the industry. So I see an abundance of opportunities where I believe this really truly characterizes my experience. I'd be lying if I said there weren't barriers to women and that unique challenges don't arise frequently. However, it's really how I've decided to deal with these experiences that's defined my career. I go out of my way to serve as a mentor and I see opportunity in each of these challenges. And rather than letting it define me or my experience, I use those experiences to build what I call a better tomorrow. I don't apologize for being confident or direct, but I do really take time to analyze how I show up in the workplace and I strategically evaluate how I can be most effective. I see a lot of positive change overall occurring in the industry. And I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of um, recent conversations with leaders from other construction firms who are really seeking to harness that HR magic that I referred to And I think this is really going to change the construction and the HR game for the better. I also love the fact that when I go to construction events, I don't have to wait to use the restroom. (laughs) You go to Sherman, it's like a line of women. And if I go to Associated Builders and Contractors or, you know, AGC, there's no line. They're all at the men's restroom and it's fantastic. Kind of like a rush concert. (laughs) Absolutely. So, I mean, I think, I think it really comes down to that optimism and being able to look at, workplace challenges as opportunities and coming up with strategic innovative approaches to be able to leverage those opportunities. And sometimes things aren't fair or they're not right. And those, those rights, those wrongs need to be fixed. But I think that in the industry, there's a lot of opportunity for women in particular to prove and really show the value that we bring and proactive progressive companies, construction firms in particular are going to be the ones that are on the cutting edge of that. A lot of our talent shortages around tradespeople, a lot of our soft skills challenges around communication, leadership, conflict resolution. Studies and research show that women are phenomenal at that. And if we only have 9% of our workforce being female, I see that as a huge neon sign saying, hey, here's a solution to one of your biggest problems. And I see the same thing with HR, that rebranding and that that representation being the average of 0.9%. If we are known for cavalier approaches to people and we don't strategically manage our people power, or we kind of are stuck in the old way, which is just compliance, check the box. That's not going to get us through that constructive disruption that I was talking about. It's going to be those companies that really look at how can we align our people strategy, our HR gurus, if you will, with the industry needs and shortages and combine those. And I see a lot of opportunity there to do that. Ashley, let's talk a bit more about the creative sourcing and, and resources. And 
you know, as someone that's in the, the industry as well, and as we've talked about, I'm really glad you're out there talking about these things because it is an industry where it's not the norm. Again, very ripe for disruption and change. You were part of a, a panel on candidate sourcing and different candidate sourcing pools and such at HR Redefine. Can you talk a bit more about the partnerships you've developed in the Denver community when it comes to finding those folks for the construction company? Part of white construction groups, I refer, we, I refer to us as WCG. So WCG's strategy has really been to put forth what we call building community. So it's this idea that when you look at HR research around construction, our relationships tend to be very transactional and the industry innately is driven around contracts. You know, we contract our work as a general contractor out to subcontractors and independent contractors. And then you've got owners and owners reps in there. And so you've just got all of these people and everything governed by these contracts. And so it's really easy to get lost in all of that and forget really what good leadership and, and people relationships include. And so part of that building community sort of strategy was, hey, crazy HR lady, aka me, we want you to find some innovative ways to solve our talent shortages. So when I first started with WCG, we were faced with a carpenter shortage. As a result, we creatively partnered with a nonprofit known as Project Worth More. So for those of you who don't know, Colorado is actually home to over 60,000 refugees. And this particular organization helps with refugee resettlement with the goal of literally building a community around these individuals. Their stance is that it's, it's not enough to just place someone in a job and kind of check that box. Their organization is all about creating meaningful work experiences and connections while spreading awareness about what the refugee experience can consist of. So we were able to solve our carpenter shortage through partnering with this nonprofit who is very passionate about their community and very passionate about people to help us meet our need which then helped improve our business, but also aligned with this, this greater good that we were putting forth in what we call building community. Obviously, I'm also a firm believer of community. So I frequently volunteer and find ways to build community activities into my role as the HR director here. An example of that is I recently joined the Mile High Sherm Workforce Readiness Committee, where we're also volunteering with an organization referred to as WOW. And WOW stands for Work Options for Women. This particular organization helps people overcome barriers to sustainable employment by building confidence in those applicants and while also providing resources related to culinary training. Their model is very unique in the sense that it's an apprenticeship model and it's criminal record friendly. So most of the individuals who go through their program tend to have a criminal record and they have a hard time finding traditional employment. From where I sit, you'd be surprised how many of these community relationships really manifest into something special. As you build and invest in them, they tend to come full circle. And I really believe it comes down to the desire to want to make a positive difference and then having the vision to strategically align that to your business goals. I think that people naturally gravitate towards that incentive, that sincerity and what I call other good humans. I'm always talking about good humans, but I think you can do anything if you have good humans at the helm and with a little creativity and innovation, you're able to align all of this people power in a way that really gives your organization a competitive advantage. I, I love that a lot. I, I love how, all the things that you're doing to just grow the community. And I love the acronym. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Putting it, putting that focus on it. And so speaking of that, so there's so much going on. There's so much of that building that you're doing. What gets you really excited about the future of work and how can HR help affect that change? Um, well, I love the fact that I think HR is making a comeback. I know at the beginning of our discussion, I talked about all of those stereotypes and labels. We like to stick with HR. All of my personality and leadership assessments tell me that I'm this sort of pioneer, catalyst, and visionary. So I always joke and say those are some big descriptions to live up to. But I think that that really speaks to my desire to always seek a way that HR can do things differently. And I think that's very exciting for HR professionals because as you know, having gone to HR redefined and SHRM and being very active in the HR network, there's a lot of fantastic HR people out there who are looking to kind of shake things up and do things differently. And they have a lot to contribute. The world is moving faster. It's more connected than ever before. All of the artificial intelligence, automation, big data advancements that are occurring I think leave a lot of room for HR to be cutting edge. Some people consider these advancements to be threats or challenges, but I really see them as these wide open doors for HR people to demonstrate their business value. 
I think smart, proactive HR people are going to take these opportunities and really use them to grow and retool themselves. I also believe that companies are starting to realize that people are the only real source of competitive advantage. And the reality is, is with that realization comes a real big incentive to invest in your people power. Chief human resource officers are still an exception and not the norm. But as CEOs continue to see the value in HR, I believe that that function will continue to be elevated in a way that's going to change the game when it comes to how we manage people operations. I also love the fact that employee engagement and company culture have become expected HR competencies and strategies. They're no longer the exception or kind of what I call the unicorn in business. They are expected and they're required if you're going to be a relevant business and if your business is going to be sustainable. So I believe there's a lot of HR magic to be found in those areas. HR magic. <laughs> I, love HR magic. I literally walk around my office. One of my employees bought me a little magic wand. <laughs> oh, so nice. In my office, I actually have a wall and it's like all colored and it's got memes on it and employee pictures and thank you notes and just funny running jokes. <laughs> because I say half of that HR magic is humor and, and goodwill and building relationships with people. And there's always going to be downsides in business. And I think when rubber meets the road and it comes to like do or die time, those relationships are tested. And if you've done a good job as a, as a leader and as an HR practitioner, those people stand by you through thick and thin fire and water. doesn't matter. They're there. It's all about the relationship. Absolutely. That's, that's the magic. That's the pixie dust. (laughs) I literally walk around and say, I'm going to go work my HR magic. (laughs) Love it. Oh my gosh. And it's so positive about what we can do to, you know, be able to make things happen and not just, ju- not just say no, we're, let's figure out how to make it happen. Let's get that magic going. I love it. Well, Ashley, it is now time for everyone's favorite part of our show, the half hour question connection. Who was your first professional mentor and what was the most important or impactful thing you learned from them? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to go with two of them. <laughs> so I had two important mentors in my life early on in my career. The first was actually a Mexican-American studies professor named Dr. Jeannie Canales. I affectionately refer to her as Dr. C. <laughs> I think I'm probably still one of the only people that can get away with that. She taught me to never hide my voice or be afraid to act on my convictions. She always encouraged me to speak, to speak up and really be confident in who I am. He actually encouraged me to speak at my undergraduate commencement ceremony. And fun fact about me is I used to be terrified of public speaking. When I tell people that today, they always laugh and say, you're speaking at conferences and hosting workshops and we'd never know that. I'm like, no, 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 no. I was terrified. I used to be very soft-spoken and just a little reserved. And she really pushed me to get out of my shell. And it, it was one of my biggest stretch goals that I've ever had, but it was one of the best. And Dr. C really represented a strong, intelligent, and compassionate female role model for me early on in my career. And I'm still just forever grateful to her, and we have a great relationship. My second role model would be my father. My father and I are extremely close. I always joke about us being twinsies (laughs) because people will be like, you sound just like your dad. And I just laugh and say, thank you. He was there when I fumbled early on in my career. You know, I've, I've worked in mining and education and now construction. And he was really witness to my early failures and blatant barriers. And he taught me through all of that adversity comes strength of character. And those experiences later became not only great leadership opportunities, but awesome beer stories. (laughs) So my dad and I can always be found, you know, usually at a brewery with beer and nachos. And I really owe a lot of my confidence and optimism to him. Ashley, who's one person you've gained in your network in the last year that you think more people should know? She goes by K.O., so Kalila Okolonola, and she's got a last name like me, so it's always a test, right? (laughs) But she actually works for True Colors, and I was blessed to be able to share my HR Redefined panel discussion with her. And for her, working at True Colors means you really live the values of truth, responsibility, and unity. And she's a big proponent of being authentically adaptive, which means you're always true to who you are, but you respect and adapt to the environment in which you're in. And so we, KO and I instantly hit it off around culture and changing the game of HR and really shifting how businesses look at talent. Her organization focuses on um, basically having gang members change their, their future 
They don't hide their past. They don't apologize for it. There's no shame in that, but there's unity in that, in that experience and struggle. And so her organization takes gang members from all different backgrounds and they all go through the same process and they're all in it together to kind of make a better future for themselves to, while contributing to the community and while changing kind of maybe some of those mistakes they've made in the past, but not covering them up, not apologizing for them necessarily, but owning them and owning the impact that has on them and their identity. And I just think she's, she's fantastic. She understands when I'm talking about culture and its relevancy and the difference between employee engagement and employee satisfaction. And we're just kindred spirits for sure. Very different um, organizations, very different sort of paths to how we got into HR, but same fundamental values and passion for people and that there's no particular face of talent, right? I think we like to tell ourselves stories about, well, this is what the perfect person looks like and they have to check all these boxes And I think in today's economy and really for progressive and effective HR departments, we're looking a lot more at the people who have the potential and the transferable skills and what I call the good human behaviors. So those soft skills and that strength of character and the ability to build strong relationships and their words match their actions and all of that fun stuff. Then about looking at at the box and saying, okay, this person's got five years in the seat and okay, they got to have one of these three degrees I mean, that day, I think that the days of doing business in HR and approaching talent acquisition from that perspective are long gone. And so I think she brings a lot to the table around passion and culture and community building. And she's a fantastic person. I think Wendy and I can agree. We were both blown away with everybody on your panel. She only lost me when she talked about jumping out of airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Though. I love it. I, I give her all the credit in the world. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. Not my thing. (laughs) You got to be brave. But, you know, when I talked to her about that, she says, I would never ask anyone to do something I wouldn't do. And so it's not like she takes her new hires and says, okay, you jump out of this plane. She always goes first. And that's because that's her commitment to them saying, I would never ask you to do anything I myself would not do. And you're never in it alone. And even if it's scary, it's okay. We can be scared together, but you're not alone. And I think that's a powerful lesson. And Honestly, I, I had just a half an hour conversation with her about onboarding alone because in construction, you know, we tend to kind of baptize people by fire. Sometimes we say, Hey, welcome to the team. This is great. Here's your desk. Here's your computer. Go forth and be successful. And Oh, by the way, if you have any questions, just ask that guy, Bob, right next to you, you'll, you'll figure it out. Like that's not good. It's scary starting a new job. I'm starting a new job. Might as well be as scary as jumping out of a plane for some people. So I think that's just one example of where HR has the ability to really change the employee experience. And I think we as HR practitioners kind of have the upper hand in the sense that we are the first sort of point of contact for a lot of these people. And so companies can use these HR folks as soldiers, if you will, to go out and lead their brand and explain their strategy and sort of indoctrinate, if you will, people into their culture and their values in a very professional, friendly and innovative way. Yeah, totally agree. Um, I'm still going to leave jumping in airplanes to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. Don't get me wrong. I give her all the credit in the world. You're absolutely right. Demonstrating that. I, I will take people to lunch or I'll find something <laughs> a little more pedestrian. I understand. <laughs> you, can, you can find some other way to be brave with your, your new hires that's somewhere between taking them to lunch and jumping out of an airplane. There's got to yes. be Fair enough. Around. There's that nice in between. <laughs> Although, you know, how many times have you gone to a new work, new place of work and nobody takes you to lunch? Yeah. You know, your first day and you're just kind of sitting there going, was I supposed to bring my lunch? Where can I, you know? <laughs> so, you know, Minimum, take them to lunch. Maximum, jump out of an airplane with them. (laughs) Anything in between is good. (laughs) Well, and something we did that was a huge game changer was we created a new hire survival guide. It's a culture blueprint. So playing on, you know, construction words and making it Ah. appropriate. But it's funny. It's meant to represent who we are as an organization. So we're very big on family and humor. And, you know, we're a very informal environment. But what you just described, we'd have people show up and say Am I supposed to go to lunch by myself or where's the fridge? Can I use that fridge? So we built a tool that, you know, shares our values and our message, but it also just addresses those basic things like, yes, you can use that fridge or no, you don't have to dress in a three piece suit when you come to work. Go ahead, bring jeans and tennis shoes. You're fine. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's great. I, I absolutely love that. So Ashley, if you could go back to the beginning of your career, what's one piece of advice you would give yourself based on what you know now? 
I would say that just because someone tells you you can't do it doesn't mean it's true. And I would also say that no doesn't mean no, never. It means no, not right now. I My career has really been built on things that, you know, people tell me I can't do or, hey, that's not possible or, you know, being willing to take the risk and be the first. So in my current organization, I'm the first HR professional we've ever hired in over 33 years of business. I was hired as the HR manager and now I'm the HR director. And that was a huge step for my organization. I mean, they saw a value in HR. They saw the potential. But 33 years of business where we had no HR is, you know, a pretty big culture shift. I also think that there's power in storytelling. I wish, you know, when I first got started, I would have written down some of my experiences and things that I'd gone through. And when I say storytelling, I mean, do it in a way that's honest, but that makes other people a part of your story. I think it's a powerful tool when it comes to leadership, when it comes to change management, when it comes to just being effective in what you're trying to get done. People really want to relate at this at this intimate level. And sometimes HR is like speaking French. You know, it's like when you sit down with engineers and they start explaining, you know, all of the architectural and, you know, st- structural issues. You're kind of like, whoa, what are we talking about? HR is like that sometimes too. And I think we would be wise and I would have been wise early on in my career to kind of take a step back and say, huh, how can I explain this in a way that's going to bring this person with me, but also engage them. And I think there's just so much power and influence and that connection that can be built through storytelling that that's something that I would recommend to people. You started to touch on it briefly a little bit earlier, Ashley. Can you talk a bit more about how you enjoy giving back to the HR community? Yeah. So I think giving back is, I mean, it's part of that good human behavior I was joking about. And I also think it's part of the magic that happens um, when you bring employees together. So for me, I mentor several people, both in my organization and outside of my organization. I mentioned I am involved in Mile High Sherm. So I volunteered at some of their events. And then I recently took the leap and joined the Workforce Readiness Committee. So I'm super proud to be part of that. I also host workshops. So recently I partnered with the Young Professionals for Associated Builders and Contractors. And I went and I did a workshop on culture, corporate culture and the future of construction workplaces. And we had people from all different levels of organizations, from subcontractors to general contractors attend. And I do that just because I really believe in the influence and and power that is HR and the potential and all of the good that can come of it. So I do that. And then obviously things like HR Redefined, I, I, I'm happy to speak at conferences. I'm happy to sit down and just, you know, meet one-on-one with people, make a lot of connections that way. And so I also try to go out of my way as the HR director to build meaningful connections in the community. A good example is we volunteer with the Crisis Center here in Douglas County. Their focus is on uh, domestic violence. And so we host, you know, seasonal drives for them. And out of that relationship, I actually ended up connecting with their executive director. And I said, Hey, do you guys do any training around, you know, domestic violence? Do you come into, you know, private businesses and do that? And they sent me a list of their trainings. And one of their trainings was around Enneagram and Enneagram is a personality assessment. And so because we had such a great relationship with this organization and we had done all of these wonderful things, their executive director was actually willing to come and give a a four hour workshop for my employees. We pared it down to two hours, but she was willing to give four hours of her time completely free to do this leadership and personality assessment for my employees. And so I think that's just one example of kind of how these relationships come full circle. And if you've got kind of a visionary and a strategic person, they know how to leverage that. Ashley, what's your favorite movie? I like the 1995 Braveheart movie starring Mel Gibson. (laughs) And this is funny because my husband, on the other hand, his favorite movie is The Notebook. And he always gets mad. <laughs> when he hears this, he's going to be mad at me. But we've been married like over nine years. We're high school sweethearts. So we've been together like 13 years. And uh, I think this difference really gives some insight into our marriage. <laughs> Plus, I just think it's funny. <laughs> That's awesome. That <laughs> wow. is awesome. How, how, how about your favorite musician or band? Oh, that's a hard one. I like all of them. It really depends on on my mood. Like I fluctuate between like old school R&B when I'm in my workflow to country when I'm just, you know, out and about. I do like some Linkin Park and that here or there. (laughs) So I'm really, I like all of it. I like opera, classical. It just really depends on my mood. How about a favorite TV show? I like Game of Thrones and I also secretly like Law and Order. (laughs) 
secretly. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's not a secret now, right? But <laughs> full disclosure. What, I love any, those. I could watch it all day. <laughs> any of them in particular or just the original? Or, there's, so, there's like 15 all on orders, aren't there? All, all of them. <laughs> all of them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I also like A Handmaiden's Tale. That's a good one. I think the book was better, but series is good. I had to laugh at Braveheart because I immediately jumped back to when I was in, well, I was in graduate school when that movie came out and it was at a Halloween party and a young lady was painted up like Braveheart, had oh, the no. kilt on in the whole nine yards. I was dressed as the Unabomber. Oh no. Uh, I was a poor graduate student and basically had a gray hoodie and sunglasses. Mm. Yeah. And this young lady, well, let's just say she probably had quite a bit of liquid courage and she was, <laughs> Playing the Mel Gibson part to a T. It was incredibly entertaining. And she I don't running know. Running around yelling freedom. Yes, exactly. <laughs> freedom. That's exactly what she did. And I don't know why I just admitted on my own show that I was the Unabomber for Halloween, but I, I did. And the judgment free zone. on a government watch list. Because it, <laughs> uh, it was many years ago. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna change subjects. So having said all that, if you're not watching Braveheart, if you're not listening to all these different types of music or watching Game of Thrones and all the Law and Orders. What else do you like to do outside of work? So I took up photography about a year ago. So I'm totally self-taught. Uh, a friend of mine gave me this old camera. It had m- missing parts, all of this. So I'm totally self-taught, but it was become a passion of mine. I've meant for years to take it up and try it. And I just never, I never made the time. Then I went to this uh, women in, in construction executive boot camp and you know, I, all of my goals kept pointing to, you need this creative outlet. You do all of this stuff and you have all these things that work. And, you know, Wendy mentioned my schooling and my education. I'm like, but what do I do just to, you know, relax something that's just an outlet. And so I got into photography and I love it. And so I started my own little Instagram page. It's totally baby infancy sort of started, but it, it's called festive elk photography. So I do that just for fun. And I love to go hiking and traveling. And then I'm a total book nerd if I'm not out adventuring, doing something, dragging my husband, you know, off into God knows where, I'm usually reading a book or hanging out. And I'm into family time and people so I can be found on the patio. Like I said, I'm a beer and nacho girl, so usually not too far from those places. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. So, Ashley, if you weren't in the HR profession, what do you think you'd be doing professionally? I believe I would be teaching and running my own nonprofit. I love to teach people. I have a huge, huge respect for educators. I volunteer a lot. That's something else. When you ask me about, you know, my volunteering, tying scholarships and my service, like I serve on several advisory committees and boards and my current organization actually founded a building community scholarship with the community college. And so I spend a lot of my time with educators and having worked, you know, on the HR side in education, I have just a real appreciation for it and a passion for it. I love to see kind of light bulbs go off and the exchange of ideas between people, I think, is fantastic. And having that be unfiltered, you know, in today's world, I feel like it's so easy to get caught up on being politically correct and saying the right thing. And people are so nervous about this that it's almost like it's become a place, education becomes this place where ideas come to die. And it's supposed to be the opposite, Right. And so with me, I'm always preaching, you know, giving people the space and grace to be themselves. And so I love, I love teaching. And then my own nonprofit would probably be focused on leadership for girls and women. I think there's a lot of work to be done around leadership and and how we show up and how we deal with these things and just really empowering um, women to just be themselves, right? And, And do what you do. And if people tell you, no, it's okay. If you love it, go be yourself. Go be that inspiration. Be that light. I think there's just a, a, a lot of great work to be done there. Ashley, I have to say, I'm glad you're not doing that. I know you would be incredibly successful if you were and never know where you, where things go down the road. I'm really glad, though, that you're not, because if you were, I probably would not have gotten to know you. I don't think we'd be talking tonight. And again, I, I, I'm a fan. <laughs> I just I really appreciate what you're doing, how you're doing it, and was so excited when even if it was just for a minute or two in New York to get a chance to visit. You know, I asked, would you come on? I was so excited that you said yes. A lot of people that are listening probably don't know you. And, and now that they've heard you are going to want to get to know you better. What's the best way for them to, to reach you out there? I say reach out to me on my LinkedIn. I'm on there all the time. So that's the best way to reach me. I am a sucker for coffee. So even if you're in another state, I'm always up for virtual coffee. I do that more frequently than not. So very open. I'd love to connect with anyone who has questions or just wants to share ideas. 
We will add that to the show notes. And Wendy, how about you? What's the best way for the listeners to find you? Best way to find me is on my blog, mydailyjourney.com. Daily is D as in dog, A-I-L-E-Y. And of course, the fourth Sunday of each month, join us on Twitter for the HR Social Hour Twitter chat at 7 p.m. Eastern time. How about you, John? HR Social Hour Podcast.podbean.com. Go to the left-hand side of the screen at the top. You'll see three little lines. Click those open. You'll find links to all my social accounts there. While you're at the site, uh, listen to an episode you haven't heard, download, rate, review, share, anything you can always do to help boost the signal. We always appreciate. So again, Ashley, appreciate you being with us tonight. So for the HR Social Hour Half Hour Podcast, I'm John. And I'm Wendy. And as always, be sure to connect, give back, and network. network. Take care, everybody. We'll see you soon.